Um, well, first of all, thanks for letting me uh, come talk to you today. I do a lot of these talks, and uh, this is one of the few ones where I actually just stay in my own bed the night before. Because I live down in the garage, and usually if I'm presenting someplace like you know, Tulsa or some other, you know, New York or something, stay in the hotel, so it's very nice to actually you know, be in my own bed before. Um, let me ask a quick question. Who here has actually heard of industrial and organizational psychology before? Okay, so we have a few things. Um, what I want to do today is kind of give you, and I'll go over the questions we'll answer, but I want to do one level set before we get into the details. Okay? And before I get to that, I'm going to do one clarification. I've read this in a conversation in the presentation. So if you have questions as I'm talking, don't be shy. I mean, I didn't make that many slides, and if you don't get through all of them, the world is going to end. So there's something you want to know more about, something you're confused about, something you want a little more clarity to, don't be shy. Number two, uh, Sometimes when I get excited, I talk a little fast. And for better or worse, these topics really excite me. So if I get going and if I miss something or you want to say something again, again, don't be shy, okay? So the level step of this presentation is people matter. All right? No matter business, no matter what we do. Again, anybody in this room disagree with that statement? Anybody have executives in their company that think might disagree with that statement? If you ever have them, there's two quotes I want you to share them. The first quote is from Andy Carnegie. You know, Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Steel. He said many years ago, if you take away my people, or leave my factories, in a few years, they'll be grasping around my factories. If you my factories, leave my people, pretty soon they'll have a better factory. It's a very powerful statement. Now, some folks will say, okay, that's just a revolution, the old bosses. Doesn't matter if you have technology. Well, there's a guy that has a real known company called Microsoft and Bill Gates, who what he said is if you take away our most important people, Microsoft will become a very unimportant company. Now he used the word 20 people here, which I would I would say that if you have your human capital uh, set up right, it's way more than 20. But the key point of this is that people matter. And for people like, like yourselves, we're in HR, you know, those are industrial organization psychologists. That is one of the key, key fundamentals of what we do, is we understand that people matter, and when you try to get value from a business, if you don't take that people component, you're going to be unimportant very soon. So, anybody here disagree with that? God, I hope not this week, let me try to this. So, three questions for today. One is, what is IO psychology? And the words IO and industrial organization, same thing. What do IO psychologists do? And really, that's for you a little bit of the meat of you know, what kind of things do we do day in, day out, and kind of how do we help interact with folks like yourselves in HR roles. And then finally, how can we help um, uh, businesses in HR? And just so you know, rather than sit here and regale you with all this academic stuff, that last bullet point, I'm going to, if we have time, I'll tell you four stories of actual work that I've done, what the situation was, what we did, what we got from this. So, let's send it to everybody. Any objections? These are the slides I made. All right, so what is IO psychology? IO psychology is very simply the application of behavioral, of applied behavioral science to the workplace. That's all there is to it. So it's things like we draw from general psychology, a little bit from management theory, from everything that has to do with people in the workplace, that's what we work. Now, an interesting point here is this great quote that says it's about enhancing the dignity and performance of human beings in the workplace. Now, that's very different than say, you know, traditional, you know, you know, management, which is only focused on the outcome, the process, the money. We recognize that, that dignity and that performance is important to focus on. Why? Because if you're a company and you only focus, if you don't focus on that, pretty soon the outcomes that you're trying to drive towards will evaporate. The people will make a difference. How many times do you stop going to, say, some restaurant or some store, not because they have the product and have any food, because the people you interact with there with are just, you know, you don't want to deal with. There's a guy Jonathan Baskin, who's a brand expert, I've seen him a couple times on CNBC. He has this quote that the people are the brand, the behavior is the brand. So as technology, our focus is how do we get the people in that brand to work right for the company. And not only to, to uh, work for the company, work right for them. You know, people spend probably more time at work than they do anywhere except for us. They spend more time doing that than they do with their families, more time than they do to enhance themselves. So we want you to make sure that we have an enhancing experience at work 
Or we make an efficient note that gives us another time to other things. Because again, if you don't focus on it there, you're going to uh, very quickly lose all your value. So any questions on that? All right, so a couple major events. I'm not going to go through these in detail. I will provide Dr. Gordon with the uh, PDF of the slides or my email over here. If this is going to email me, I'll happily send you uh, details of these slides. But we'll go over a couple of major historical events to provide context of what IO psychology is and how we got to where we are. Um, up here is Frederick Taylor. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, Frederick Taylor, principal of scientific management. Okay. The Industrial Revolution starts up in the 1800s. 1911, Frederick Taylor does a thing called principal scientific management. He was the first one to do things like time motion studies and measure like, you know, things like how much time does it take to, to you know, shovel coal and other kinds of things. Um, that became important to us psychology because that's one of the first times that we really started to measure the work. When we start measuring work, you can measure how people do the work and improve that. Uh, if you go much to the 1913, you probably was the first high psychology book. 1917, <coughs> the history of us here, no 1917. What major event was the U.S. involved in then? World War I, that's right. World War I, we were actually had a whole bunch of folks who were trying to go and send out to World War I. Now, prior to this in the Army, the way you got assigned to either a, a, an officer or a list or a different job was who was your family? If you were one of these, you know, Elite families, you were an officer. If you were, you know, Joe Schmo found some farm or inner city or something, you were an enlisted person, and that's what you show me. The Army Alpha and the Army Beta were, one was a written, one was a verbal, uh, were basically the first attempts at an adult intelligence test so they could say, what is capability? You know, there's, there were problems with it, there, you know, it wasn't the best one, you know, they, they wouldn't meet today's standards of fairness. But it was the first one attempt to say, you know what? We can look at people and really evaluate them based upon their capabilities and how well they do the job, not just on, you know, was there a great grandfather or some general such, such and such. Okay? Um, the next one is the Hawthorne experiments. Anybody ever heard of these from HR studies, management class? Okay. For those who have the Hawthorne Electric Plant just outside of Chicago was a electrical plant. Okay? And they had they were doing some experiments, and going back to Taylorism, but they said, let's mess with the lights in this plant. And let's see how production goes up and down based on the change in the lights. So they turn the volume of the lights up, they turn them down, they change the wires, they change the hue. I mean, literally everything you can mess with. Supposedly, at one point, they were nearly pitch dark. What they found was, though, every single time they made a change to the lights and the working conditions, the productivity went up. So what they discovered was, because the productivity went up, because they, the people working that plant realized that they were being watched. They felt special. It was that it was really the first time it was an engagement. So that was one of the key things was, you know what, people are not like machines or like today computers, you know. A machine and a computer will always do what you tell it to. It may not do what you want it to, but if it does something, someone somewhere gave those instructions. Human beings are a lot more complicated. They are a lot more in the process. Um, another important was in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Someone may say, well, what does that have to do with industrial and organizational psychology? And the answer is quite a bit. Because that began the discussion of when you're hiring people for jobs, you cannot discriminate against people in your selection process. And it's one of the big things, this is one of the two things I'll ask you to take away from this session. One of the big things that IO psychologists work with in companies is how do you differentiate, but not discriminate? Okay, I'm going to repeat that explain but differentiate, not discriminate. What that means is this, not everybody is meant every single job, okay? Some folks are good accountants, some folks are good mechanics, some folks are good computer programmers, you know, some folks are good, you know, stand up and talk to rooms full of people, all right? Not everyone's meant to every job. So in, in HR, you guys know that sometimes when you even hire somebody, you're taking a risk of bringing that person in. You're hoping they're going to work out, but sometimes it just doesn't. Well, a lot of what we do is we help, I used to call this people in HR, say, what are the key parts of this job task? And we'll move this in a little more detail in a few minutes. What are the job tasks here? What are the things we can look for in these people so that we can take the people who are really good from those who wouldn't for them without adversely impacting and unfairly applying standards of people looking for these jobs? Okay? And to follow up to that, there are the problems in Americans with Disabilities Act. You know, as you know, the ADA says that um, you can't discriminate some, against someone based upon uh, perceived mental or physical defect. And it says that employers have to make a reasonable accommodation 
for folks who can do the job, the key functions of the job. Well, how do you know what the key functions of that job are? A big part of what I as a psychologist do is, is, is looking at um, those kinds of things, and we'll talk a little bit more detail about that in a few minutes. The question was, just for being simple history is, where does Iowa psychology sit with psychology continuum? Well, we'll simply put, over here on the left, you've got like a psychologist who sit there and lay you down on the couch and have you talk about your mother and dream you had about a horse and a tangent with that before. We don't do that, okay? I've said for years I'm going to be a clinical psychologist, I was going to make the med school so I could give them drugs and give them to calm down. But you know, as a psychologist over here, we're looking at improving performance. Moreover, if we look at the applied versus the academic side of psychology, there are some psychologists who just sit there in an office all day and do experiments and research and navel gaze and publish in the journal of applied, you know, double entendres or something. I don't know. We actually are out in the field saying, how can we work with you guys to, uh, to, to make life work like that? Because like I said, a lot of folks spend a lot of time at work. Okay? We'll get this in more detail in a moment. Um, and just so you know, there's only seven things listed here, right? The American Psychological Association has 56 active divisions, and some of them retire. So the point of that is, there's a lot of different kinds of folks out there calling themselves psychologists. And we're just, you know, one of those groups. Okay? All right. So, okay. Any questions on what Iowa psychology is, I can answer. We're going to what Iowa psychologists do. Okay? And you guys in the back of me, okay? Okay. All right. If I don't see head nods, I get nervous. All right. So what do Iowa psychologists do? Well, first, let's talk about where we work. Um, I have psychologists who take this graph, and this came from a, a very recent publication by Landy and Conti. Um, we work a lot of different places. And actually, this, I think, is probably, I, I tried to find the source for this data from the book, but it wasn't in there. Um, I think this may only be applying to folks who have PhDs. It doesn't include those who have masters. And there's a lot of folks who call themselves high psychologists that have just a master's degree. Um, we'll talk in a minute about the, the technicalities of that. But, you know, this says 41% work in academia. Um, other numbers I've seen close to 33%, but there's a pretty good number of folks who are working at universities, they're training people, they're training other grad students, they're doing research, they're saying, well, what would you write? There's about 24% of employees that work in consulting. And those are people who work in pure consulting arenas. So they might work for some big consulting firms like you know, IBM, uh, Consulting Division, Accenture you may have heard of, Deloitte Touche, you know, consulting firms like that. Or there's a couple of big ones like DEI and PEI, which you may have heard of, that do like, you know, very people-focused things. And then there's a lot of people working in private organizations. Um, you know, uh, Walmart, just up the street in Bentonville, hires a ton of Iowa psychologists. There's a guy I went to grad school with who is the director of talent management there, or one of them, because they have several. Um, Home Depot out in Atlanta, they love hiring Iowa psychologists. Interestingly, J.C. Penney, who we all know has been in the news for because they're not doing so well right now, used to have a ton of IO psychologists on staff working with the Human Resources Department to take care of, you know, not just the administrative HR thing, but how do you perform that? Well, about three or four years ago, they managed to run just about everybody out. And a couple of folks I know there had say they really don't, the, the current leadership doesn't really take them as seriously as they used to. And you saw what happened. I'm not saying it's because they got rid of us, but yeah. You know, Neat coincidence, huh? Um, a lot of folks, it says uh, public sector, that's the government. I have no idea what this other means. So I don't know if there are people working like a island or something. Interestingly, if you look here, I purposely have consulting and academia next to each other. Because a lot of folks, myself included, will either be a full time academic that consult part time, or a full time consultant who works academia part time. So a lot of folks go back and forth on that. And that, again, is a very big difference for us psychologists is many of us do that because we want to stay abreast of the cutting edge research. We want to stay abreast of uh, you know, what's out there and what's changing, what's developing. So, does that make sense? So, questions I owe psychologists get. And these are some of the common ones. Um, I threw these up here. You guys may have them. If you have others, again, just throw them out. Are you so kind of shrink? Well, Short answer is sort of depends on the definition. So the term psychologist, uh, in many states, we call it take a term like physician or dentist or attorney. So I can say in Arkansas, I can technically call myself a psychologist, 
because I teach at, a, you know, at civil psychology departments at some universities. Now, what I can't do is have a clinical psychologist, because those are folks who do therapy. State of California, you can't call yourself a psychologist unless you have a degree and you have passed uh, the EP3, which is one of those states. And usually you have to go to school in California there's some unique courses they require in California. State of Virginia, by, by converse, I can go there and get a license real easily because you know, they have no applied psychologist license requirements on this do that. I think there's one state, I think it's more like code all you need a master's and like one recommendation from a licensed person who is a psychologist. So it varies quite a bit. Other question we get is, do you do therapy? Absolutely, positively, absolutely not. I know psychologists don't do therapy. Now, a lot of us do what we call executive coaching. Now, a number of folks say, well, what's the difference between therapy and coaching? And uh, what's the difference between having a psychologist do coaching versus somebody who's been through, say, the International Coaching Federation Certification? Here's the difference. If you have a clinical or a counseling person comes and wants to do therapy, their assumption, and again, clinical use refers to a mental, a mental issue, counseling is refers to an emotional issue. Their assumption is that there's something wrong with that person that needs to be fixed. So, you know, you can't, you, you're having problems interacting with others, uh, you've had childhood trauma, going through some emotional issue. Their assumption is you need to be fixed. Executive coaching, and what I as an do is coaching, assumes that you are not necessarily normal, that's not really a, that's a, that's a term psychologists hate because what does normal mean, right? They assume you're at least functional. And when we're functional, we want to help you improve and work better. So we want to drive you forward, help you say, what are my behaviors in the workplace and how can I make those behaviors more effective to improve my productivity? Now the difference between say an IO psychologist and someone who's been through the say National Coaching Federation certification is We've all been through anywhere from, if you took a master's to, if you have a doctorate, you know, anywhere from four to eight years of additional training. Well, those IFC programs are about you know, anywhere from three days to two weeks. So you don't get into a lot of things that you do, you know, all the nuances. Also, you're not taught to look for things like, you know, what, if someone does have to go to some actual counseling. Now, if someone says to a IFC trained coach, you know, hey, you know, I hope you like your IFC certified and, and, and upset by this, okay. So you know they don't get the things like, what is OCD? If you're an OCD, if somebody says to a lot of folks, I'm OCD, that's me. If they say it to me, I'm going to say, well, tell me what that means. Well, International Coach Federation says I see it. I see it, yeah. I go backwards. You can't get a certification through ICF in a three-day program. Well, there are some, but I may get confused, but there are some people who like three-day sessions. There are three-day sessions, but chances of ICF having a credit. Right. Um, but uh, a coach trained, you know, a certified coach, um, isn't there to diagnose? Right, exactly. So, and, we, and we don't diagnose either. What we are trying to do is spot where you somebody says somebody who can diagnose. So again, OCD. If somebody says I'm really OCD, I'll say, what does that mean? They say, well, everything's got to be just perfect. Okay, no big deal. Now if they say, I can't leave my house without tapping my stove ten times the wooden spoon, and I've got ten circles around the building before I walk in, you know, then we're going to say, well, let's go talk to my friend over here who can really help with that. Well, it's very different perspective. Well, and, and that's what we're trained to do. Yeah, exactly. So, that's what we're okay. All right, so other questions. Um, do you work for companies or are you product consultant? The answer is yes, it all depends. As we saw from the back before, we were internal or external. Some folks are independent, some folks work for companies. It's all over the place. Do you work in HR? Answer is some of us do. And most of our consulting engagements are through HR departments. So like I said, um, you know, Walmart has a lot, Home Depot has a lot, uh, United Airlines has a lot. There's a lot of different places that are outside college and internal. Usually they're the bigger firms. Um, I've rarely seen too many firms with less than say about 10,000 FTEs that have an outside college internal. But I've seen firms, which we'll talk about in a minute, as small as 50 people engage the services of an psychologist for some specific support. Okay? So lastly, what do you actually do? And this is the bank of an IO psychologist existence because we're with our families, with our friends, and people who don't work in HR and understand nothing about what we talk about. Trying to explain what the heck we do is all been possible. <coughs> you know, my my daily part of mother once said I was a human relations consultant. Which I don't know what that means, but it just doesn't sound as as nice as a you know, trained psychologist. So, 
Any questions on this? Any burning question that flow up here just can't resist asking that. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about three key areas that I psychologists work on. The first one is research. And this is where we're looking for answers to tough questions. Because again, most of us with PhDs, we're trying to, you know, detail, we have a lot of strong research methodology um, and, and how you, know, you do it in the right way, how you do it without, um, you know, leaving trouble. You know, like I, myself with my, team, with my teaching work, I have to hold a license for National Institute of Health uh, for conducting research with participants, which means I've been through training so that I don't, you know, get, do harm in the research. Um, research falls into two categories. First category is academic, and again, these are folks, these are professors who sit there and, you know, write a bunch of journal articles, think tanks. Um, there's a company called Hub now in D.C. that's big of this. Uh, Center for Creative Leadership. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. Center for Creative Leadership out in North Carolina. They're a big research uh, arm of that. And they have folks who have to apply that research to train. Uh, peer reviewed journals, again, this is the, you know, basically the journal of um, upside down ontology and things that, you know, have article names you can't pronounce and they're 10 pages long. No one likes to read. My husband, Chris Worley, who's a world famous psychologist from USC, who once referred to some of these as the ever more sophisticated search to be irrelevant. So we're going to try to focus on relevant. Applied research is where we work with people like yourselves to find out answers to the questions that you have. First thing we talk about is survey research. Um, a lot of IO psychologists do survey research because there's a lot of statistics involved in that, a lot of data collection. Um, we, you know, my first job out of grad school was, I worked for a company out of Chicago, that what we did was patient, physician, and um, uh, uh, employee satisfaction surveys for healthcare companies, sort of hospitals. So we go in, collect the data, analyze it, you know, build all kinds of algorithms, and then sit there with them on how they work with, use that data to make improvements to the organization and move that needle from the negative to the positive. Um, Focus groups, again, people say, well, I do a lot of focus groups. Now, a lot of folks like yourselves are also trained in things like that. They say, well, why don't I as a college do that? Well, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. A lot of times when we get involved in those, it's more because either A, a specific topic that we are, have a particular background in, or B, we can learn a lot because sometimes it's better to have a, a, a non, a face that don't know in the room. And again, it always blows my mind how much I will engage with someone, they'll tell me something, I would tell their boss, the boss goes, oh, that's brilliant, and they become the boss I think for like, you know, three years. I always want to apologize when it happens, but at least they're starting to listen. Lastly, a lot of human capital leading practices. And I'm going to point out here that I use the words human capital. Anybody want to guess why I say human capital and not human resources? Any guesses? Wow. You seem to like this something out. Okay. So when one of the challenges, you know, if you read HR Magazine, you read OD Practitioner, you read ASP Magazine, one of the challenges for folks in the field that we all work in, which really the people in the business field, is getting the people who can sign the checkbook or commit resources to make something happen, understand what we're doing, understand the value of it. And I remember a few years ago, I was sitting there, and we were trying to convince this one CFO who was just, I think the word curmudgeon would be a compliment to this guy. To, to, to buy this project, and we can talk about this human resources project. And finally he said, I'm not going to do anything that involves human resources. And, and it kind of caught me off guard, and I said, well, help me explain what you mean by that. And what he explained was is, and this is the first time I heard this, I kind of carried it forward. There are some folks in the financial realm who think about different kinds of assets, a resource asset versus a capital asset. Think of a resource asset that's consumable, it's depreciable, loses value over time. So, you know, paper, copy machine, things like, you know, pens, all those things, they're, they're, they're used, they're, they're consumable, they use them. A capital asset, by converse, are things like your building, your intellectual property, your, uh, you know, the, the, the branding of your company. If you invest in those things, over time, they increase in value. And what we have to really do is, and again, this is why I was thinking capital, this is the second thing I want you to take away in addition to the, uh, you know, differentiate without discriminating. The human capital, if you invest in it right, it will grow in value over time. It will continue to add value over time. And a big part of what you know, 
I even find myself doing a lot of is sitting there with you know executives and usually somebody like yourself next to me, you know, because I'm because we're working together in tandem and telling more stories about, you know what, here's what we invested, here was this other group's outcome, here's what they benefited. Maybe you need to listen to your HR person here and let's make some investments so you can get things better. And we also back it up with a lot of the da -da -da, leading practices research. Because also there are journal articles to people and amazingly some CEOs if you throw enough, enough journal articles at them, they won't read them. If they figure if the stack's high enough, it must be real. It's very strange. So any questions on that, on what we do in research? Okay. So the second big category we look at is what we call industrial psychology. And again, industrial organization. So what is industrial psychology? Industrial psychology is the work community, is the person, is the individual. How do we find out how to get the individual to do this job right? Okay? So there's some things we do related to that. Number one is things like job analysis. And when I go through all these, I'll tell you a story that I think really illustrates the importance of this. Job analysis is really sitting there and saying, you know, what's involved in this job? What are the KSAs? What are the key functions? What are the you know, um, what are the things that make this movement? You know, and, and a lot of times people have job descriptions that are anything from very robust, very accurate, down to, you know, literally I've seen before, there are two sentences that says, show the work other duties to sign. That doesn't tell you a whole lot. That doesn't work a well. lot. Now, when you have to do your job analysis, you can then start into things like employee selection. How do you select the right employees for the job? Is it a structured interview? Is there some kind of you know, test or something like that? Is it, you know, it's a whole mess of different things you can do. And how do you do that? So again, it differentiates but with fairness and also depends from a legal standpoint. I mean, HR folks, let's face it, you guys get pulled into legal discussions of what's legal and what's not a whole, whole lot. You know, I, I, when I first met Arkansas about three years ago, um, it really caught me, at least in Central Arkansas, that a lot of the discussions at the show chapter there are really more about the legal issues. Because, you know, that's what you're dealing with mostly are things like I-9s and, you know, um, you know, is this selection process defensible? Did something go to Bob over here do something that was illegal when, you know, when raiding our employees? You know, so we do a lot with those. Psychological testing. There's a whole, whole, whole mess of psychological tests out there. There's the Myers Briggs, everybody's heard of it. There is the, uh, you know, the Berkman, which I use a lot, Home Personal Inventory, you name it, there's one thing over everything. Um, and it's really important when doing psychological testing to make sure that you actually deal with IO psychologists, because, you know, even if you can say a clinical psychologist focused on healthcare, on the healthcare side, they won't have this PHR certification, they don't have to keep you out of trouble. There's actually a really famous uh, case back in the late 80s, early 90s, and it becomes something of an urban legend in the field, where uh, two retail firms, I won't say which ones, but one has a big giant target for their symbol, hint, hint, and the other reads a lot of stuff. Well, they decided they wanted to start including psychological testing as part of their selection for our employees. They got, uh, they hired some people to help them with that, and again, depending on which version of the story you hear, it was either down in California, who was a clinical psychologist decided he just wasn't making enough money as a clinical psychologist and started an IO, or was a company in Kansas that was just testing. But regardless of where it was from, the, this particular set of consultants advised these clients to use something called the Minnesota Metaphasic Personality Inventory. Anybody ever heard of this thing? Okay. Okay. So the MMPI is a well-researched, well-validated, and I mean just robust instrument. Last time I took it, Took me like two hours to get through. Here's the problem. It has questions about things like your religious views, your sexual behavior, and I, and I mean they're rude questions. Now, if you were hiring hourly employees, making, you know, let's say it was about 725 as an national minimum wage, something like that, if you were hiring, would you want to spend two hours to do that selection? Moreover, how likely do you think you are to get sued for having a selection instrument that includes those things as part of your your uh, process. Well, big shocker, lawsuits are plenty. So when doing testing, one of the things that we help them do is avoid stuff like that. I have clients that say, I want to use an MPI, and I say, have a good time. The only, the only place I know where it's used to use effectively is uh, I have a colleague from the school that I teach at. 
He lives in Florida, and his job is to help select people for the police force together. So he used it to, because it identifies deviants very well, he used to say, is this person going to be a deviant because you don't want to give a deviant a badge? So in those cases, it makes sense, but normally, you don't want to do that. Um, performance appraisal is a plan. Again, how do you review that performance? How do you rate people? Again, it goes back to job analysis. How do you rate folks for how well they do their job? And finally, train development. So this individual side is actually very, very important. I'll give you an example. Um, back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lady named Joyce Hogan who at that point in time taught at the uh, University of Tulsa, just a few miles from here. And she had called that Central Fire Department because they were basically being sued. You know, there's an old joke in uh, I.S. Psychology, the client calls you and says it will be here tomorrow. Your words, first word out of your mouth would be why, what happened? Because odds are it was something bad. So the Central Fire Department was being sued because they had physical abilities testing as part of their uh, selection process. These physical abilities tests, um, again, everybody here I assume for physical, personally, for physical as far as adverse impact, all that kind of stuff, okay. So, there was adverse impact on females and uh, men of certain fashion, uh, ethnicities, primarily uh, Asians. Well, what happened was is, Joyce goes out, and again, our psychologist says, you know what, let's look at this job. And they discovered that to be a firefighter, you have to have these physical abilities. And when you control out for you know, those typical things, it was fully valid. It doesn't mean there were no women not being selected. It doesn't mean there were no, this was selected less often. Because you need to be able to carry a 200 person, pound person down a ladder. So those are the kinds of things I ask psychology to get into a lot with this is, you know, that selection, that defensibility, things like that. So any questions on the organizational industrial side, excuse me, before we move on? No? Okay. All right, cool. Organizational psychology. This is more the corporate side, a lot of things, strategy, tying to the business goals, things of that nature. And again, the unit of analysis is the corporation, the department, the business unit, it's just the group in, in the workplace. The kinds of things that we tend to do here are things like leadership and coaching, that we talked about a little bit ago. Um, and some people say, well, why is this in organizational side, not the I side? Well, number one, there's a lot of debate about that, and most folks go on this side, though, because when you're doing leadership development, you're not just developing that individual, but you do things like succession planning. How do you find your next group of leaders? More importantly, how do you line up those leadership behaviors with the goals of your organization? You know, I think we've all seen from the news, there are some leaders who will succeed wonderfully in some organizations. They'll get hired somewhere else and fall flat on their face. How do you watch out for that? More importantly, how do you make sure you can take somebody who's a development leader or high potential and move them up the ladder in such a way as to grow them so they're not over their head. I mean, how many leaders have we seen fail in the last just five years and move them Some of them, you know, it's wonderful to watch unless you work there. Um, what else do we do? Uh, motivation, job satisfaction, employee engagement. Employee engagement is a big term now. I think, uh, was it two months ago there's a big section in HR magazine about engagement? Was that two months ago? Something like that. Big section about employee engagement there. How do you get folks to, you know, want to be part of the organization? You know, if people are just having, um, you know, absenteeism or worse, you guess what presenteeism is? Guess what that term? My favorite term is presenteeism, where someone is present, but they're not doing anything. They're not quite social loafing, but they're just kind of you know, hanging out. So, so how do you get those engaged to have presenteeism or absenteeism issues? Change management. I mean, one of the books I have up here was, you know, I bought six copies. First come, first serve, everyone wants to take them. Um, change management, I have never seen an organization that wasn't going through some changes. I have also seen very few organizations that didn't have more than one change all the time. And one of the things that we work with is, again, how do you get folks to buy into that change? How do you get them to manage it? And there's a whole slew of things that I as a college do around managing that change. And, and that's where I say people can place like Accenture or Deloitte or some of the big IT consulting firms. We can borrow into those because they know we're going to slap in a big SAP system or we're going to slap in a big, you know, uh, great claims or, you know, people software. How do you manage all that change? That's where we want to help them do that properly. 
Because as we all know, you know despite what Kevin Costner says, he builds dreams. Just because you build it does not mean they'll come. So she said, what else do we do? Uh, organizational culture. Culture is another very popular topic. You know, go to Amazon, type in organizational culture, and it just comes up with books upon books upon books. The and culture is important because that's a lot of what, you know, there's all of a sudden there's this, this debate about what's more important, strategy or culture. Of course, the response is both. Because the strategy where you want to go, the culture's how to get there. Culture in your organization is the habits, the norms, and the beliefs of the people in your organization. And it's demonstrated by the outputs, the artifacts, and the outcomes of that organization. And you know, unless you have anybody having the right habits and doing the right things day in and day out, they're not going to behave the way you need to be better. So we get a little involved with stuff like that. Um, and the last one is diversity. You know, diversity is, is a really important topic. Um, you know, as, as the, the, the landscape of our world changes, especially here in the U.S., as, as the world becomes you know, more different kinds of people, making sure everyone's included and involved is critical, critical, critical. Now, here's the problem. Way to the organization to handle diversity this way. Okay, I'm going to stick all the people in the room for, two, for an hour and a half, let somebody talk, diversity's done, let's move on. If I could see that and say I have to train. That doesn't get squat up. Okay? All that does is give you a lot of work for now. What diversity really needs to be about is how do you include folks who are there? If you, if you have you know, only one kind of personalization, how do you go find others who are qualified to be there? More importantly, how do you make diversity really about being different thoughts to contribute to the overall thought process? Because everything we see shows that the more different kinds of thoughts you have addressing a problem, well, as long as you're not causing you know, problems. But the more that has a lot of one problem, the better your solution is going to be. And that's, and that's an aspect of diversity that's just left out a lot. So I as psychologists do a lot with, with that issue as well. Any questions on this? Any thoughts? Okay. So other areas we can involved in. Um, number one is engineering psychology. This really is a, is a subset, of, subset of that the ergonomics. How do you engineer the workplace? Uh, there's actually a really neat program out of Arizona State University that really all they focus on is how do you design, you know, not some of the chair, but like, you know, the, the, those crazy keyboards I've like, had for a while, one of those. Or how do you do all like, the touch screens and stuff? A lot of psychologists get involved in that. Another area we work a lot in is consumer psychology. Um, this is how do you get the consumer base to um, go there. There's a guy named John Watson, who was one of the early IO psychologists. Um, Unfortunately, he was kind of scandalous. He got went out in like 1934 or something like that. So he goes into work, I think it was Macy's or something like that in New York, just work on the floor. Somehow talks his way to the executive suite and became really the first consumer psychologist saying, you know, we understand behavior, we understand how you manage that. How do we use that knowledge to um, manage consumers? So it's things like market research. Again, I know psychologists can do a lot, and I'm in a lot of statistics. Um, I think between my master's and my doctorate, I had probably six semesters of things that had to do with statistics and research methods. And we love numbers, we're that nerdy. Um, market research like that, branding, how do you brand things? Notice I didn't put subliminal advertising up here, despite what some folks think you don't get involved in that. At least no one I know is involved in that, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere. And lastly, um, strategic planning. More and more with the recognition, like you said, that people matter. We're being asked to be brought in to help out with uh, strategic planning. And I'll be very honest with you, I won't walk into one of those, those conversations with, with a client unless I'm bringing one of you people with me. And here's the reason why. I can walk in and say, yeah, research says this, best practice says this, here's a war story. What I can't say is, what's really gone on in this organization to let up all this? Because if you don't take that into account, your efforts aren't going to be that great. So we get very interested in planning, and again, one of the books I've really said, please take this, so I haven't got a load back with um, It's really about the strategic planning process and how, and, and what's the thought process goes into that. This is far too often, I'm sure you've never seen this. Strategic planning is a matter of stick a bunch of executives in a room for two or three days, let them yell at each other, come with some ideas, go to finance and say what's cheapest and go do that. Regardless of whether or not it makes any sense or not. When we take more of a people approach to it, 
and say, how do we take, you know, what can we really do, what can we deliver, what our customers really want, then let's go much more effective. And again, that's where the psychology of thought play. Any questions on those? Thoughts? So again, how can IOS psychology help uh, business HR? And again, I'm not going to reveal you with OS systems in the book. I want to tell you four more stories of what things that, again, these are ones I was actually involved in. They're across different companies. The names have been changed. You pick the guilty. So these are hopefully real examples that you'll we'll, we'll appreciate. So let's start with um, one of the things we do is we link people and business issues to results. Okay? And this is one of my organizational culture. So this was a very large healthcare system up in, let's call it the Midwest, city by a really big lake, Bill Bears. Okay? It's in that metro area. This system was formed by the merger of two systems, one of them for-profit, one of them non-profit. So one of the hospitals for-profit, one of the hospitals not-profit. And interestingly, one of them has a lot of hospitals and a few clinics, one had a few hospitals and a whole lot of clinics. So two very different organizations. Short version is they weren't playing together right. And their patient satisfaction started taking a hit. Now, if any of you guys work in hospitals, you know if your patient satisfaction starts taking a hit, your revenue is going to start going down. That's going to get bad for you very, very fast. You're going to have joint commission come and check in on you very, very quickly. So the CEO said, I'm happy with this. I want everyone playing together. I want everyone working together. And I want to know how to wait to measure to be able to do that. Again, measurements are really important term. So what we did is we sat down with the CEO on the board and we said, you know what, let's create a common culture. Again, the habits, the norms, the beliefs. Let's create a common culture across the organization. We're going to define it, because you guys know how you change the culture? Ever told you this? Okay. I'm going to tell you something. There's books like this, they've been on this, I'm going to explain to you in like three senses. Define the culture you want, put processes in place to, to support that, and then you sit on people to make them become happy. Now, except the fact that some folks are just going to leave because they don't like it. That's kind of what we did here, is we defined it, the process in place, and we said, this better become habit. And we also started a semi-annual survey. We surveyed a subset of the people in each organization to say, what are their leadership and what are these behaviors being presented in this organization? Now, the CEO did something else for me, where he told the executives of all these hospitals, he said, if you are not scoring higher on this, the first one was a baseline, he said, if you don't go up every, every time we do this, you don't get your bonus. And as we all know, what you pay, it's paid for performance, whether you like it or not. So, believe it or not, they started focusing on this. Those scores went up, and over 24 months, the patient satisfaction at all sites increased. Some of the Bible, some of the Bible, the point is there was positive, there was positive growth. So that's example one. Example number two is where we provide specialized knowledge and skills. And again, this is to where, you know, this is a small advertising firm, um, and they've grown from five, five to 50 people in about three years. Now, if anybody's ever been involved in a startup like that, you know that you know, initially it seems really cool, but suddenly you hit that wall, and it's that uh -oh moment where you kind of, you know, theory specs into reality, and excitement becomes fear. They were at that moment, and they were experiencing a 75% turnover rate amongst their sales staff. Now, even in uh, advertising sales, that is a ridiculous, ridiculous sales rate. I mean, I think, I mean, retail and restaurants are like 50% utilized across the board. So they're just absolutely ridiculous. And then what we found out was talking to them was this was their ability, this is the way they hired to train their sales staff. So the sales manager put an ad in a little paper. He would call. He said, yeah, I know what talk to He talked to him five minutes ago. Yeah, you seem cool to be here Monday. He'd sit on a desk. Say, here's your call sheet. Go to hospital, go sell some stuff. Well, big shocker, most folks did not do well with that. Um, they washed out really quickly. They got frustrated. They didn't make their bonuses. It's the only place they paid for a small base and a really cool bonus for sold a lot. Well, they just didn't know how to do it. So what we did was we helped them with developing a recruitment program. You know, we changed the selection process from the, um, the, the, man, the, the manager was talking to them and saying, okay, Give me an example of what you've done X, Y, or Z and actually reading their answer based on quality answer given examples and behavior and your brain skills. Uh, we changed the training program from there's your desk, here's your call sheet to here's the whole process. Here's the script. Here's what you do. Here's an objection. Here's how you handle objection. And we changed the evaluation program from, again, I'm not making this up. They've gone to, um, what was it, Office Depot or Office Max or whatever it was supposed to buy there. You know those little package you can buy that say performance evaluations? 
They bought one of those and only used the first page on the back page. So obviously they didn't take it too seriously. So we created a customized one based upon what the job would require. Well, what happened with that? Well, net net is within the first two quarters, their annualized um, um, turnover dropped from 75% to 25%. Because all the new folks that came in, all the new system, like the better stuff around, and even more impressive, their sales went up 17% the first quarter. Now, I say, well, 17% is not that much, but you know, let's say if you're any big company, any executive, if you tell them sales go up 70%, trust me, they will be excited. So that's step number two. Another way we go my way is this trusted advisor approach, where basically we get brought in and somebody says, you know what, what in the world should we do? So this client was a big high level provider up in, uh, up, up, up in the Northeast. And they were, they were the biggest one, they get the biggest one in the country. But their technicians, the guys who have to go out and fix the lines, like you guys went to the snowstorm last year, all the guys came in from other parts of the country and climbed the lines and this stuff, that's these guys. Their apprentice to journey program, there's specific rules that follow from that, was taking two to three times, depending upon the class, the industry average. And even when they got through that program, their uh, apprentices and their journeymen were not at the same level. They were, they were just enough to pass the, the standards, but they weren't at the level of other, of the standards of others. And they were like, you know, we're, we shouldn't have this. And what really got in trouble was um, this organization is a semi-government organization, and so a lot of local politicians got involved and were upset about it, so it was a big, big mess. So they brought us in, we looked at it, we found out that there were a couple problems. Number one is, their job descriptions, again, going back to the first thing we usually do, some of them were 42 years old. Yeah, that, that was my response too, I started shaking my head. And the other 42 years old, because they were younger than me until I was 41. So we said, well, we're going to fix all these. And we also gave them some real serious recommendations for how to improve their training program to go from, again, just go follow Joe around the truck and, make, and do what he does, to say, you know what, here's some steps you have to go through, and you know, here's the way we manage you, here's how to make sure people have these things. Now, I will take on this one. You notice there's not any results right here. This was about a year or so ago when we did this, and um, if anyone who works in a union environment will appreciate this, every, every recommendation made has to be through the union, and they're still negotiating an overall union contract, so it's all kind of a big holy thing right now. But it's that trusted advisor role, and the unions are finally starting to realize, hey, you know, this makes sense. And the unions were the one who liked the old job descriptions, actually. So we actually had to put engage with the union and say, you know what, here's the problem with these old job descriptions. They don't protect your staff. They don't protect you. So we get a lot of those conversations. And of course, as you all know, unions serve a very important purpose, but man, they're challenging from the other side. So last but not least, um, this is a specialized staff augmentation. Um, that's the nice way to put this. I put that up there because, um, um, you know, I'm going to send out the PDF of these. What this actually means is that a uh, moment where uh, someone's up against the wall and he's actually pair of hands in the right to fix the problem. Um, this is a really large healthcare system. Just, again, full disclosure, I'd say about a third of my work over the years has been dealing with hospitals. Um, the chief warning officer of a large faith based system was asked to, and again, this place had about 20 hospitals and nine health clinics, was asked to develop a leadership development program that had measurable results. He developed a program. He forgot the result, the measurement part. Now, this was not that big a deal until um, one of the, the, the magazines in our field, and I won't say which ones, if I say you'll probably be able to figure out who it was, he ends up having a big story about him on this leadership program in this magazine and about how great it was, he started talking about you know, the, how they're measuring this stuff, which he didn't have. After this magazine comes out, somebody throws it on his CEO's desk and calls him and says, hey, that's cool, let me see those numbers. This one was a case where the guy literally, been, this guy been a for years, calls him and he says, hey, Jimmy, can you be here tomorrow? So I said, why, what happened? Again, up against the wall, needed specialized skills, came in, you know, a lot of things happened like this. So what we did is went in and conducted surveys, focus group, and interviews to really develop measurement, to understand and measure how that program was doing versus the um, previous uh, visual program. 
We also opened up some recommendations and implemented an ongoing measurement structure so that as other folks look at this program, you can measure not just the outcomes, but also your pre and post measurement leadership skills, perception of those, to help drive forward that quality. And interestingly enough, um, the data from this was called the Evolve Award application, which if you guys don't know how much detail the Evolve Award requires, I mean, this was a really big deal for them. This is a couple other things we really got done with that. And the last I heard, they actually won their state level bottles for healthcare. So obviously there's, there's, there's some benefits there. So with that, what else do y'all want to know? All right, well, if that's the case then, um, I will simply throw this up there. If you have any questions, there's my contact info. Welcome to books. Uh, and, um, I guess everybody have a five-minute gift of time.